Well, hello everybody and welcome to this next session of our ICTHUS Leaders Conference 2021, A House of Sacrifice. And we are so looking forward to being together now in God's presence. Whether you're watching live with us now, whether you're tuning into this later, our prayer is that you're going to hear the voice of the Lord speaking into your heart, into your life, into your ministry, into the world that you're engaging with around you. And uh, why don't we just prepare our hearts um, for worship. In just a moment, Kaz is going to be leading us in songs of worship. And a bit later on, Roger is going to be bringing us a word on the theme for this time, which is authority and power. Authority and power. And uh, I was just reflecting on that title. I was thinking how right from the start of this year... In Ixus, as we've been praying and fasting and seeking the Lord together, um, the whole um, idea of humility has been coming back to us time and time again. And uh, as we think about this realm of power and authority, we want to approach the Lord in humility, don't we, to receive what he's got to give us. And so I just felt maybe together with me, you would like to, at the start of this session, if you can, you'd like to just um, show your offering to God, your offering of yourself to him by kneeling together with me. I'm going to kneel down in just a moment just to invite the Lord to come and uh, to say, Lord, we, don't, we want to be less. We want you to be more, Lord Jesus. We want you to be lifted up. If you can't kneel, you can do that in the attitude of your heart together with me as we pray. So let's kneel if we can. Lord Jesus, Lord, this is just a simple act of humility, Lord. It's an act that says we worship you, Lord, that you are our Lord, that you are our King. Lord, that we want to release the control of our lives and make sure that it's firmly in your hands as your followers and your people. But Lord, we want to open our hands and our hearts now to receive all that you've got to give us to receive the words that you want to speak to us. So Lord, meet us in our worship, we pray. And may you be lifted up. May you be glorified. May you be magnified, Jesus, so that the world may see that you are God. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to worship together. I'm going to hand over to Kaz. And let's continue to receive from the presence of God. Good morning, everyone. Let's lift our eyes to Jesus, the enthroned one, the one who is coming, the king above it all, the one who reigns. Jesus, thank you, Lord. He's coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down, and every chain will break as broken hearts declare His praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power. sins of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb every knee will bow before him let's sing again he's coming he's coming on the clouds kings and kingdoms will Every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. Who can stop the Lord? sins of the world, his blood breaks the chains, every knee 
Welcome the Lord to make his way. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. He's coming. God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord? Jesus. 
Let's pray together. Fill this place, Lord. Fill this place, Lord. With your presence. Fill this place, Lord. With your presence. Fill this place, Lord. With your presence. What a 
I just felt so powerfully as we were singing that song, the truth that the Lord was wanting to speak over us and speak into our lives. There's a line that says, what a powerful truth that I am known, that I am loved, that I'm a child of God. Maybe there's some of us just listening here now and you need to receive that truth afresh into your heart and life. You're known, you're loved, you're a child of God. Thank you, Lord, that this is the truth that sets us free. Thank you, Lord, that this is the truth that breaks the power of the lies. Whatever the enemy has been whispering to us, however he sought to undermine us, pull the rug from under our feet, however he sought to diminish us in our own sight, Lord, I thank you that you love us, that we're your children, that we can receive your love and your Holy Spirit's power for everything that you call us to. Lord, let that truth just sink deep 
into our hearts, into our spirits. Wash away the lies of the enemy, we pray. Thank you, Jesus. As we were worshipping, I was seeing a picture of a beautiful lawn, green grass. But right in the middle of this lawn, it was as though someone had driven a bit of a lawnmower. And there was a bit that was just cut away and shorter than the rest. And it spoiled the, the beauty of this lawn. And I felt that there was somebody, maybe you feel that that's happened um, in your life or in your ministry, that the enemy has made an inroad. He's cut some things away. He's damaged some growth. But as I looked in the picture, I saw that the grass was starting to grow again. And it was like, you know, when you cut your hair and it grows back even faster and thicker, it was the same. This grass was coming through much thicker, much taller even than the rest. And I felt the Lord was um, confirming and affirming to you that whatever has been cut away, that there's new growth to come, new multiplication, new life, that he's not finished with that aspect of your life, your ministry yet. He's going to come and he's going to bring the growth again. So thank you, Jesus. And Lord, may we remain in courage and confidence with you in these difficult times as we seek to fulfill our responsibilities amongst the people of God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Kaz, and thank you to the worship team. We're going to be returning um, to worship towards the end of our session. And uh, in just a few moments, we're going to be hearing from Roger. He's going to bring the word to us um, on this topic of authority and power. Um, and you will see um, when Roger comes onto the screen, you'll see that he is actually at a different location to this one. He's not at Lee Green, but he's speaking to us from the Dietrich Bonhoeffer Church, which is in Forest Hill. Um, and there's a reason for that. Not only is it a very beautiful environment to speak from, um, but also Roger is going to be mentioning and talking about Bonhoeffer um, a little bit later on. And so it seemed like a really fitting tribute um, to the man um, as we're going to think about him and his life and how he shows us Jesus. So we're going to read some verses um, to prepare our hearts for what Roger is going to share. And we'll read them from Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27 down to the end of the chapter. I'm sure you'll be familiar with them. But let's be thinking about the authority and the power that we see in these verses. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it or have dominion over it, some translations say. And rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth, which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Hello folks, I hope you all had a good rest and you're ready for another day of uh, intensity <laughs> in seeking to touch into the mind of God. What I am going to do this session is take up three diff different and uh, also um, three diverse subjects, but hopefully Time will tell, we'll show how they might fit together. Many of you have been puzzled, and uh, I have too, at the terrific um, 
chaos that's going, been going on in the United States. There's nothing much else we can say about it. It's the disorder and at the same time the uh, so-called lies and false lies and real lies and uh, many more types of lies and then people claiming this is done or that's done and so on. And people denying it at the same time. You'd think that mankind never had a desire to speak and think and act according to truth or to find out truth. And has left us with a great mist of confusion. Part of that confusion is found also in theology. The theological confusion is something which is involved in all the um, North American activities in voting and not voting and whether votes are counted or not and so on. All that kind of thing. I've wanted to talk about it too, ICSUS, for quite a long time because it has within it the very seeds that Jesus warned us about that we're to be careful, that we are to test things, that uh, we just don't sail along in our theological grasp and in our seeking to be discipleship, to be discipled by Jesus. It's something which we can be deceived in. And if we just totally ignore that, of course, we're wide open to it. But we're told, watch and pray. And uh, there are many things gone out into the world, according to the New Testament, whereby we can be deceived. And these deceptions are part of Christian life to learn how to overcome them, uh, how to avoid them, how to see through them. So I, I wanted to talk about that for some while. And one of the things that I want to talk about is what's called dominionism. You notice that uh, as the text was read, uh, although it was from other, another, not the King James Version that Debbie was reading, she added in the word dominion where it occurs and where it comes from in this um, very inadequate and brief allusion I'm going to make to it today. But that, I believe, is a part of the confusion that lies behind the deceptions that are going on and something that we as Christians who want to be at our best for God, we need to exercise our hearts and uh, interact and rub off on each other in order that we might get deeper to understand the truth. So I shall begin with that, and uh, let's call that a movement. It's a movement that's going on around the world, but of course largely stems from where we ourselves in Ixus have had a lot of input over the years. Quite a number of speakers from the United States, and it's the United States that I'm referring to, where this chaos is becoming evident now. And in our engagement with it, we want to see our way through what is truth and what is lies, what is the mind of God and what is the inventions of men. What we are to commit ourselves to with totality of our being, as truth demands it, we require it and function properly, and the sorts of things which are going to hinder us getting to the end of what we're intending to be for God on this earth. And then the second M I'm going to emphasize is a man. I'm going to talk about a man who illustrates the kind of godliness which is not going to be disturbed by the compromises, the half-truths, and so on and which can be a model for us. So that's a man who's a model 
two m's in fact, <laughs> m, m squared. So we've got, uh, we've got a movement we've got to be aware of, and we've got a man who can be a model to us. And thirdly, we'll wind up with where humanity, where the Church of Christ is meant to be heading, which is to see the second coming and to see the evangelization of the world. The two things go hand in hand. Now, the half-truths, partial truths, um, watered-down truths, twisted truths, which I'm referring to, we mustn't be so superior, otherwise we've been misled ourselves. But we do want to just think briefly about this dominion theology. The first thing to notice is we shouldn't really draw dominion as the name of a movement out of this uh, verses that we read, because um, some versions you see hasn't even haven't even got the word dominion. They've got other words that translate the same Hebrew word. And we are uh, using it, though, because that's the popular term. It's also called New Apostolic Reformation. Have you come across that? Other times it's the seven mountains of truth. You come across that, seven mountains. So it's M for mountain we've got here. Those mountains are mountains like we've got to take them over, we've got to rule them, we've got to dominate them. And they are the mountains, of course, of politics. <clears throat> That's, of course, it is true for the Old Testament where Israel was both the spiritual and the political movement all in one. But God, we believe, has separated these and has shown us something different in Jesus. But if we govern those and spend our time seeking to govern them, then we're going to get off track and miss the end point, the purpose of our mission. It's easier in some ways to take over, shall we say, the field of it, the mountain of entertainment rather than win a person to a personal knowledge of Jesus. You don't get so much opprobrium and you uh, can compel a listening point. But God's truth doesn't come through to people this way. And we've got to avoid it. We can spend all our time, therefore, in dominionism, dominating every form and type of life around us and think we're gaining so much ground. Well, we might be gaining ground, but not necessarily gaining ground for the gospel. The trouble is that in this whole field, the warning I want to give you is many of the things that we've sought after ourselves in Ixus are the things which are taken by the dominionism and misused changed, altered their objectives and so on. And um, they're very close, some of the things that we think are very precious. I think engaging in spiritual warfare is very important. That has been hijacked into the dominion sphere. Uh, there are other areas concerning our Lord's return. They have been uh, reproduced in their teaching in such a way that we've got to think it through carefully, not be misled and think, oh, yes, this is really what we believe. We want to get some more of this. And I want to think carefully about those things, but we've only got a few minutes which we're going to spend on the subject. And, uh, but it is a kind of an introduction, an introduction to help you to feel a little bit more at home with what's going on in the world. A lot of people feel out of joint with it, don't understand the things that have been happening in America. I want to say to you that 
These things are part and parcel of the enemy's territory and we need to be on the lookout so that we can see where people are being misled. And uh, that's a huge subject and I would need to spend a lot of time talking about it to justify my assertions. But you can also go by your intuition. When I first um, came across some of these theologies that uh, Dominion Theology produces, sometimes it's called Reconstructionism. Reconstructionism, the seven, seven mountains that we must take over and conquer and climb and get to the top of them. Um, Dominionism and so on. There are other names. I've got some written down here. The New Apostolic Reformation. You see, some people who are great proponents of these things have been over to Ixus. They've spent time with us. We've had um, Peter Wagner. He is uh, the one who introduced the idea of the New Apostolic Reformation, and a part of his reforming and reconstructing, and a part of domineering, is that he, um, he 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 was very very interesting to listen to, and I think many of us were blessed by him. But then he started off saying he wrote to me saying, "Would I, I all I needed was five hundred pounds, and uh, the price of." a high-class hotel in Singapore, I could be one of the 25 new prophets. That he has chosen and were gathering together for this new apostolic reformation. I just felt there was something that's nothing to do with Christianity I've tried to be living. It didn't relate to inside me. So you can spot some of these things simply intuitively. So it's not all based upon how much you studied, although it's good to study. It's more important that we're in touch with Jesus. What do you want, Lord? What's your way? Which leads me to somebody who I believe did live that way and would be a great example to us. This building has been erected in memory of him. He was martyred under Hitler. He was a part of the Lutheran Church. And the Lutheran Church um, didn't give very much room for him, but in 1880. 88, 89, somewhere in there. Wellhausen, German theologian, brought out um, his documentary theory of how the, new, the scriptures were put together, not quite by chance, but a bit from here and a bit from there and stuck together somewhat haphazardly. And the only way to understand was to isolate them to where they came from which would generally kill, kill it by that time. <laughs> and uh, it was the, almost the starting point of very, very strong liberal theology. Uh, why didn't I become a liberal theologian? Well, again, I don't think that inwardly I could really commit myself to it. I couldn't give my soul to it. I couldn't give my spirit to pour itself into that mould. But anyway, German theology began to get very liberal. And uh, by the time um, Bonhoeffer, who is our hero for this 
next five minutes or ten minutes. Is it? Um, <clears throat> Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, was born to a high-class family. Um, he himself had many gifts, including he, he could play the piano and magnificently, and it was thought that maybe he would find his life's work in that. And when he chose, he said he wanted to become a theologian. <clears throat> Do you think that's unusual? He longed to be a theologian. Why? He wanted to know God and walk with God. He's not a stranger to that. That's exactly what I found in my own life. And many of you have felt that. That's why you've given yourself to the service of our Lord. And he had this great desire and decided to study in which had a long history of theology from Luther on down to our own day. He wanted to study in the German uh, tradition <clears throat> of theology. And uh, it was as a theologian, again and again, he had to take steps that he couldn't follow on what was happening at the rise of Hitler in 1933. And he knew he could never uh, work for Hitler or or uh, fight. So he didn't want to go into the army, fight for Hitler. And he also saw the way in which human beings, Jews in particular, were being treated by him. And he raised his voice on some of these issues, particularly on for the Jews, and became disliked, even though at first his ability to um, contact and relate to the Jews was welcomed by certain Germans. He um, s spent a lot of time in study in Berlin University as, and other places, and he found himself um, traveling around Germany uh, in order to keep contact with various remarkable men who were trying to stand out against Hitler. And eventually, out of the German church, a whole movement was, uh, was formed which was opposing Hitler. And Hitler knew it and set about seeking to destroy it. Um, it's Martin Niermuller. I had the privilege of knowing him. Uh, say knowing him. Yes, sorry, I'm <laughs> talking in extravagances. <laughs> I was, went to a meeting as a boy and heard him speak and tell us some of his stories. But they set up what was called the um, uh, confessional church. Confessed itself and following Christ and he had opportunities to meet up with people all over Germany in the works that he got. In fact, some people called him at one point that he was a double agent because he got work from the government that gave him the opportunity to do this. But in his heart was this desire to set up um, work which was going in the opposite direction from Hitler because, again, Although a lot of the church had turned over to being, dis being misled, as I've been indicating in other things, again, it, the Holy Spirit doesn't leave us totally alone. The Spirit does help us if we're willing to walk with his way. And he found himself in a position where he could, from his brother-in-law, learn of much that was going on and make plans and preparations for the removal of Jews out of Germany, uh, so finding pathways, channels for them to um, be able to use their the, uh, ex uh, ex visas and the like that he could get for them. 
And he stood the, his ground there. And uh, the last two years of the war, up to 1945, he found himself in prison. Um, in prison because he took a pathway opposing the government of the day. That's one reason why Dominionists try to get power over the government so that they can use the government for their own ends. But you can't use the government to push theology down people's throats or to get God's will done by making them do it because Jesus never did it that way. And we don't do it that way. Uh, however, in his experience, he was considered tra uh, treacherous and um, he was going to be executed. Well, he was only two weeks before the end of the war. And um, he and his death because of his obedience to Christ and his, what we would say is a true godly manliness. He was a real man. He, God made man after his own image. That is Jesus. Anything outside that vision of Jesus is not of God. It's what we're warning ourselves about. And um, he wrote some wonderful things wrote some wonderful things from prison. Um, there's posthumous letters um, written and published 1951. And uh, I should tell you, of course, that during his study periods and the early part of his ministry, he came over here and he used to minister, not in this building, because his building was um, bombed in the war and this rebuilt by Bishop Bell, a great friend of Bonhoeffer. And uh, we owe, as Icarus, a lot to that um, because the German church here had been so kind to us. They couldn't have been kinder the way they've put themselves out and worked with us so that we could um, grow and... Uh, grow nearer to Christ and go more like, like him, work hard in this area. We are gra very grateful to the um, Bonhoeffer Church, as we call it. Well, when he was finally hanged in prison, this is what was written about him by uh, a German doctor who was on hand at the time. He says, I have hardly ever seen a man die so entirely submissive to the will of God. Now that sounds like the Christianity that I embraced when I first got converted. That looks like the sort of Christianity that I would follow. Bonhoeffer himself is full of truth. Listen to this. Um, make, make quite clear that Christ, help, help, Christ helps us not by virtue of his omnipotence, but by virtue of his weakness and suffering. Takes some thinking about, doesn't it? Not by virtue of his wicked, uh, of, of his uh, omnipotence, but by virtue of his weakness and suffering. The Bible directs man to God. Um, powerlessness, God's powerlessness and suffering. Only the suffering of God can help. Uh, God has suffered, we see that on the cross. And we are men and women of Christ, we are men and women of the cross. That's where we want, want, need and will identify with God and meet him. So don't let's ever find ourselves misled 
deceived, taken off, continuously come back to that kind of Christianity, which makes Jesus very lovable, makes Jesus lovable, and we find Jesus in us. Now, moving on to the third M that I mentioned, mission. I've already raised the point that was mainly in my mind when I decided I wanted to, I would take up something of the whole business of dominionism. That is that it has a lot to say about the second coming. And he makes out very strongly how much we are kings and priests now. And we are dominioning it, we are kinging it over people. Do you notice that? Over people. Whoever they are, whatever they are, whether they're politicians, whether they are um, military, whether they are artists, whether they're musicians, whatever. The whole idea of dominion is just reign over it all, the church reign over it all. Not the church being reigned over by God. We're kings and priests, quotations that come after our Lord's return. But um, if we're reigning now and entering into that area, it's very, very difficult to enter into that area and walk like Jesus did. We don't look so much like him. That's the deception of it. And um, I just want to point out that the mission of Jesus is not for us to, it is for us to, roll, uh, to engage if, if it's necessary, if it comes our way with spirit powers in order to see the Lord return. But it's more important <laughs> that we are uh, moving towards the second coming by seeing people, co people converted and not just the fulfilling of a kind of um, <clears throat> program of taking over everything. <clears throat> the church has often had to struggle with this one from the earliest days being deflected from walking humbly, being martyred, and so on. It's much better, really, than to get to the place where we're in control. So we get the authorities under us by getting them converted. The kings acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, not just them, and hope that the day will become an easy day for us. Jesus never called us to an easy day like that. He called us to follow him. And if we follow him, did he have opposition? Did he have the authorities against him? Did he have the problem of, uh, of the identifying with the poor and seeking to meet the, need, the needs of the poor? Something, again, I didn't mention, but... Bonhoeffer is known for what he did amongst the, the um, less blessed human beings in this world. We mustn't, mustn't join this very fast-growing camp that is moving to the second coming, to take it over, to make it happen. The only way we make it happen is by getting people converted by in putting their hand into the hand of Jesus and tell them to go forth with him, learn from his ways. How did he live? How did he go? That is the Christianity. We must live and must promote, not a sort of super victorious victor, victor, um, Christianity, but one that is learning to walk in the path of humility suffering if necessary and learning to look more and more like Jesus because he's in us and he's making himself seen through us and the man that is uh, being saved is the man Jesus in us 
being expressed all over again so that he can be seen in all the earth. We want the world to see Jesus. It isn't people who take it upon themselves to dominate, to rule, and to have the authority and power of this world. It seems almost diametrically opposite to the kind of military power so that um, Jesus expressed, but to live in the pathway of Christ and bring glory to his name. We're not aiming at this end product that we are a ruling church and then Jesus will come again. That's dominionism. We are the suffering church. And he that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So it says, that's how Jesus lived. It's what the apostles lived, all, every, every one of them except Judas. We are a people who do, want, do not want to be deflected into another Christianity. There is only one, and where there is only one, we stand together and express, help one another express that kind of Christianity. Not necessarily admire and adulate those who look very different from Jesus, but adulate those and build up and tell others to follow those who, even though they're paying the cost for it, are showing us what Jesus is like and taking the good news through the world. Those are the ones that we follow as we follow him. Are you with us? Are we going that way? Amen. Amen. We're going with you. Thank you so much, Roger. Um, Deeply challenging, all those things that Roger has been sharing. And we're going to take a few minutes just to unpack them and to apply them and to talk to the Lord about them ourselves. Just before we do that, I should just mention apologies if you experienced a bit of interruption um, during the, the preach then. The internet was down um, in our building. But just to um, let you know that the whole preach will be uploaded separately. So if you want to go back and watch again, if you missed any part of it, um, you'll be able to do that afterwards. But we're just going to, I'm going to sum up a little bit with a few thoughts that will help us just to bring our hearts to the Lord in the light of all that Roger has been sharing there. He has brought to us three aspects to consider about power and authority in the church. A movement, a man and a model, and a mission. And I'm going to bring out a few thoughts from these that perhaps will challenge us in our own leadership contexts. First of all, in this area of dominionism, the dominion movement, with its wrong view of the use of power in the church, trying to conquer the mountains in society, the mountains Roger mentioned, they're things like education, religion, family, business, government and the military, arts and entertainment, media. These are the things in view. And perhaps some of us want to go away and do a little bit more research into this um, whole area of theology to shed some light on some of the issues that the church in the States is facing in these highly politically charged times um, that we're in, just as Roger was referring to. But I believe that we can also apply it more personally to ourselves. Are there ways that we can see the ideas in dominion theology influencing our leadership and our exercise of authority? In a desire to make an impact on the world, for Jesus, have we followed the world's road to success? And perhaps we can just ask ourselves honestly for a minute or two, where any of the following things I'm going to mention, where they might have empowered our leadership, either deliberately or unconsciously, perhaps. But where has popularity influenced our leadership? 
Where has impressing people with our skills or our abilities or our achievements? Where do we see status or prestige playing a part in how we exercise authority? Where do we see money or resources seeking to be powerful? Where do we see fear or shock and awe in our leadership? where we wow people into submission, into following? Or even, I dare to mention, where do we see spiritual power at work that is not the Holy Spirit? Because there can be spiritual dynamics released in the church that are not from Jesus. Where might we have seen or experienced or touched into those? These are all methods that the world uses to conquer its mountains and to use that that dominion terminology. But it should not be that way among Jesus' followers. And the Lord may use some of these methods, of course, to further his purposes through us, but as leaders in the church, our authority must come from heaven, from the Holy Spirit at work in us and through us, and from his anointing for the role that we have and the work that we do. And so perhaps we just need some of us quietly to renounce some of those factors if they do play a part in how we exercise leadership and we can talk to the Lord about it. And we'll have opportunity in a moment um, as we turn to worship to do that. Secondly, just to mention the man, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, that Roger presented to us as a model of sacrificial service to Jesus. He was a great hero in the faith in so many areas of his life, but he was also one who experienced weakness and suffering, and perhaps he didn't always look like a great mover and shaker for the kingdom in his lifetime. And I think there's a challenge in this for us here about who we look up to, who are our heroes in the Christian scene. What is it that makes us follow someone on Twitter or listen to their podcasts, or watch their videos, or take on board the things that they're putting out there into the Christian scene? What is it that attracts us, actually? Is it their outward um, influence and success? Or is it the quality and the closeness of their walk with Jesus? Is it what we can see of Jesus in them that makes them a hero? And perhaps we should just quietly review in this time we have who we're listening to, at the moment, who we're taking notice of, the voices that are speaking into our lives. Are, they, are there any that don't really show us much of Jesus at all? And perhaps we should take a step away from them. And finally, the mission. This is what the Lord gives us power and authority for, isn't it? To accomplish the Great Commission, to see the second coming. And I'm going to read to us Um, as we return to worship, just some of the scriptures that were on Roger's heart for us to keep right in the forefront of our thinking and at the heart of all of our activity as God's people. And as I read these scriptures, perhaps we can just take the opportunity to realign our priorities where we need to, to keep the spread of the gospel front and center in all that we do. Matthew 28 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Habakkuk 2. Verse 14, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Matthew 24, 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations and then the end will come. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a song of worship together, and I want to invite you to take this time to respond to the Lord over any of those things that I've been bringing before us that Roger has been sharing. Let's bring our hearts to him as we sing. Jesus. 
Jesus, I have never seen a life so beautiful. Never known a love that burns so pure. A life of such humility, though sun and Ending in the greatest sacrifice, Jesus, you. Jesus, I've never seen. Jesus, I have never seen a life so beautiful. Never known a love that burns so pure. A life of such humility, though sun and air. Lord Jesus, just thank you so much for the words of that song that just point us to you. And Lord Jesus, we see you, we see your life, we see your sacrifice, we see the power that flowed from that 
death on the cross for us. And Lord, we are so grateful. We're grateful that we worship a God who looks like you. And Lord, I want to pray for all of us now as we've been bringing our hearts before you. Lord, I pray for all those who have leadership responsibilities in your church. Lord, I pray especially for them, Lord, that you will help us. Lord, help each and every one of us to look more like Jesus in the role that we carry. Help us, Lord, strip away the things that come from the world's view of power and authority. Strip them away from us, Lord, because we don't want those things in our lives or in our ministry, in our words, in our activity with others. We don't want those things that don't speak of you, Jesus. Lord, we pray that your beautiful image might be seen more and more clearly, more and more powerfully, Lord, in us as we seek to serve you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and to continue your work in our hearts and lives now as we continue in a place of worship. Thank you, Lord. We're going to continue to worship for a few more minutes um, before we come to the end of our session and close. But as we do that, I would like to invite us to give our offerings to the Lord so we have an opportunity now. As you know, um, we're not charging for this conference, but we do want to invite if there are gifts in your heart to give that you would do that during this time. So um, there should be a slide that will come up on the screen and show you how you can do that, how you can give your offerings um, during this time. We're going to continue in worship, just give the Holy Spirit time to speak if there's anything else that he wants to say before we come to close, and Roger's got a closing word for us. So let's worship, let's give to the Lord, let's listen to him before we close. Thank you.
Wonderful. Well, thank you for those who have given your offerings. They are to further the work of Jesus throughout the world. And I'm going to invite Roger to come. He's going to bring um, a final word, a final thought that he wants to share with us before we close our time in this session together. Roger. Thank you. There are one or two things I want to explain. First and foremost... I felt uh, it was very inadequate because I spoke about dominionism without going to its roots and explaining how it came about and how it's operating today. It's running through evangelical theology and it's running through evangelical um, situations so much so that people think that that is what evangelicals stand for and it's not encouraging folk to love us very much but I want to think about it so that we get back to the real thing secondly <clears throat> my basic rule is not to criticize other believers and I want to add that although it's very difficult to talk about the new new apostolic reformation without talking about Peter Wagner Peter who has been over to us in Hicksus and I've enjoyed his uh, fellowship very much in various uh, things I've been occupied with. And um, for the Lord's sake, he's a very approachable and, and uh, lovely man. I wouldn't want to criticize him or denigrate him. The Lord um, doesn't want us to do that to each other. So please forgive me if you think that I've done that. I'd rather commend him and uh, I'm just warning that there is something about the New Apostolic Reformation that is not very um, acceptable in my opinion. But he himself, uh, Peter Wagner, is a lovely man and is a sincere follower of Jesus. <clears throat> Thirdly, I felt um, that my daughter's summing up of things uh, when I finished, was far better than my preach about them. It was very, very helpful. And uh, I just want to put my imprimatur on them that uh, I thoroughly agreed with her assertions. But I thought I should really finish again because of the inadequacy once again in just a short space of time 
of presenting to you the work and the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. It's um, certainly worth spending time thinking about and looking into. I just say that because I, I as probably many of you as I know, uh, come from a very, uh, very different theological background and of fellowship. Um, we we uh, had a very different sort of background, but I found his um, works, which I uh, the cost of discipleship and books like that, very, very challenging. And I want to commend them to you. It's full of little aphorisms. I want to finish with some of the things that he said, if I can't have time to talk to you about all the things that he did. But um, many of you have used the phrase, the, uh, which you can find in The Cost of Discipleship, it was produced in 1937, and uh, he talks about cheap grace. And I would like us to think about this in relationship to the Christianity we've got used to in this country. It doesn't seem to be getting or hasn't been over the years of my Christian life getting deeper, the Christianity we have been getting used to is, uh, seems to have got shallower. But this is what he's dealing with in Germany in the 1930s. Cheap grace uh, preaching, cheap grace, that's his phrase, cheap grace preaching, no price in it, forgiveness, without requiring repentance. It's worthy of thinking about. The uh, um, gospel is not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved, full stop. It's repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Preaching forgiveness without requiring repentance. Preaching baptism without church discipline. I think that's a bit challenging to think about, isn't it? These are things I'd like you to think about. And they're just a little taste of the sort of thing that Bonhoeffer has sought to live and um, spread, about, uh, spread abroad amongst believers. Preaching communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipline. Grace without a cross. To take up our cross and follow Jesus. Grace without Jesus Christ. Living and incarnate. That's worth thinking about, isn't it? Bonhoeffer was a pacifist. And until a certain point, and the struggle over the whole business, should he get involved with the um, execution of, of Hitler to save people from suffering, a big problem that many of us still grapple with when it comes to the whole business of power in the church. Um, Here's an, uh, another one I'd like to bring to you. I, I think um, you may have, if you were listening carefully, heard it. But I've said it before. Um, the Bible directs man to God's powerlessness and suffering. Only the suffering of God can help. Bible makes it quite clear that Christ helps us, but not by virtue of his omnipotence, which he is, he's all powerful, but by virtue of the weakness and suffering, his weakness on the cross and his suffering for us. Meet the Lord there if we dare. And we've reached the place where he, his power is available. 
There are two words in the Bible translated power, in the Greek, I should say. The first is the word which is emphasizing authority, exousia. And I think you could say that Bonhoeffer was a man who walked in the authority of Jesus. Secondly is the word um, which emphasizes uh, sort of sheer power, omnipotent power, if you like. And it's um, energia. You can hear, hear the word energy there, can't you? Ergia. Energia. It's not that Jesus isn't energetic. Energia, though, is the power, stark power, which gets things done by sheer power, but not the power of the wonderful life, presence, and authority of Jesus. We are a people who carry that Christ in us. And I want people to see him, don't you? Not us and our cleverness and our greatness, but in we want the world to see the real Jesus. That and that alone is the one worthy of our death, if you like. Because we do die, don't we? When you take up your cross, you're taking up your death. You're saying, I want to die and live for another. And he begins to live in us. And people meet Jesus by meeting us. If we're living in the discipleship life. Forgive me from taking a bit more time. But I felt I, it, uh, I needed to make some of those points clear. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, Roger's given us a lot to think about. Um, we're going to close our session at this point, but first I'll just remind you that at three o'clock we've got some seminars that will be coming up um, online in this stream of our Leaders Conference 2021, House of Sacrifice. And uh, all of the seminars are in the theme of church after lockdown and uh, different aspects of our church life um, flowing out from that place. So please do tune in for one of those. Have a look at three o'clock. Um, see if there's something that you would like to take hold of. But otherwise, we're going to say God bless you. Let's go deeper with the Lord in some of these things that have been shared with us today. God bless you.